talked about that particular um, night, April 3rd, 68. From your recollection, describe for you, for you, April 4th, 68. Well, I can't, I can't give you a recollection because I have none. <laughs> I don't remember that day at all. Um, the day I remember is the funeral. And uh, what I remember about the funeral is that lights, cameras everywhere, and it was hot. And I was on my mother's lap. I was a little restless. Um, and during the middle of the service, they end up playing the uh, piece where my father talks about his own eulogy at the end of the John Major Instinct sermon that he had delivered February 4th. 1968 at Ebenezer. Now here is the thing. 
a few days before, when my mother was preparing me, and this is the part that I'm told, when she was preparing me uh, to see my father lay down in the casket, she told me, you're, when you see your father, um, first of all, your father is going on to live with God. He's, you know, a spirit. And when you see him, he won't be able to talk to you. Because she knew that whenever daddy came home, I used to run up in his arms and we had this kissing game. Now, I do remember the kissing game. Mm -hmm. She didn't tell me about that. Um, and so here at the funeral, suddenly, here's daddy's voice. And she didn't realize that she had told me, you won't be able to talk to you anymore. But I'm hearing his voice, even though he's not talking directly to me. I'm hearing my dad, and I'm, I'm literally, you know, there's probably film where I'm looking <laughs> around. And she said I was looking, she said I was looking like he was coming up out of the casket. Uh, that was very confusing for me that day. Um, and then I do remember, I don't, I, I don't remember going out of the church. Yes, I do. I remember, I remember the casket going by. We get out of the church. And then I fall asleep along the route that we walk from Ebenezer to Morehouse. I wake up at Morehouse, and your kids are just strange, the things we notice. <laughs> so I'm looking up at the stage, and it just looked like something was not angled right. It was like something was crooked, and that's all I remember. I don't remember speeches. I just remember my dad's voice at the actual funeral. I don't think any, anybody can comprehend what the, your life was like and that of your sister and your brothers and your mother in the years afterwards. Hmm. Because you, this, this huge figure, who for you is daddy, mm -hmm. but for the rest of the world is, is this icon. Um, talk about that, having to go forward and he's not there. Yeah. Well, it was, it was tough for all of us in different ways. Um, for, um, for me, it was the incessant drive of looking for another daddy. It's like, can they be my daddy? So we had these photographers that were around a lot. And when I think about it now, it's like paparazzi. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Uh, growing up, we had a lot of photographers around, but we had some after. And I can't remember if it was Flip Schulke uh, or someone else, but at one point I said, can he be my dad? Because they were around so much. Uh, and it's interesting because don't, kids don't really register color the same way that we do as adults. Um, and uh, so that was one thing, you know, I was looking for daddy, um, Uncle Andy became, you know, like a surrogate father to all of us. He was actually the only one who stayed around, really, out of everybody. Consistently came by to see us and, and everything. Uh, and, uh, and then there was another gentleman, Bob Green. I don't know if you know Dr. Robert Green, mm -hmm. who's an educator, um, worked in the movement in the latter stages. But they came around a lot. The other thing for me, is that initially I was fearful that something would happen to my mom. So in the initial stage, I was like, please don't go. Because when she would leave to go out of the house, out of town especially, I didn't know she would come back. Uh, so, you know, we had that kind of trauma. Um, and from, my journey was probably totally different from everybody else's because they had, including Dexter, they had an opportunity to spend time with Daddy on the road doing some of the work. Dexter got to go with him to tour some areas of Mississippi. Martin and Yolanda, uh, Martin went with him there as well, but Martin and Yolanda got to go on a couple of marches or so. I didn't do anything. So I'm the child that is clueless as to whatever has taken place. Uh, so I'm trying to sort all of this out, and my mom is trying to hold it all together. Mm -hmm. And I don't know this personally, but what she shared, you know, even in her recent book that was published, My Life, My Love, My Legacy, uh, she, um, she talked about trying to pull it together coming out of that room because of that void, that emptiness. And Martin was in the bed right there next to her, and she had to do what she needed to do 
in that room before she emerged because she had to go into mommy role, she had to go into carrying the legacy role, building the King Center and all the work that she was doing. And I never saw my mother really cry, cry. She was just this strong figure. Um, but she helped to try to translate all of this for us and help us understand that our father made an important sacrifice for all humankind. Um, and, and I think that's what helped us ultimately, because I went through my cycle of hating, anger, and still struggle a little bit with the anger, but I think because of the things she taught us along the way that she modeled, it kept us. Because, I mean, what we went through, and then my uncle the next year, being found in his pool mysteriously, and he didn't drown, no water in his lungs. He was there when daddy was assassinated, so we're thinking something's connected. Um, according to, you know, the accounts of Alveda and, and the brothers that, Vida heard him say, you know, I know you know something about my, my, my brother's, uh, uh, no, she heard a f her, her father say, um, I, I think she said, I know you know something, um, or that somebody said I'm coming after you. Or, oh, he said I'm, I'm coming after you or something. I can't remember. I don't want to get it wrong. But the point is that he was mysteriously found in his pool. Then my grandmother gets shot. Right. So we're dealing with, for me, in a matter of six years as a child, I'm trying to sort through all of this. So, by, so, so, by, so by 11 years old, dad is assassinated. Uncle Uncle killed, uncle's killed. Grandmother's shot. killed. <laughs> in six years. In six years as a child. So I couldn't figure all of this out. And I didn't talk a lot as a kid. So you can imagine I'm holding all of this in, and my mother did in the early stages brought a psychologist in, a psychiatrist actually, just to check on us to see if we were okay. And they felt that we were okay. The problem is they didn't come consistently. And so we're carrying this stuff, processing this stuff. PTSD. Yeah, and we're being taught about love, about forgiveness. We're being taught by our grandfather, be thankful for what you have left when you gathered the family together. Um, so. You know, I've had a lot of processing to do in my adulthood because we just kept moving. Mama kept us focused on the work, you know, the importance of serving and giving. Um, and, uh, you know, I tell people to this day, you know, not only with anger, but I'm still trying as we, have, as we approach this 50th anniversary of his assassination. I've, I've had a lot of emotional moments. <laughs> it's almost like, I'm not reliving, it's like, to a certain extent, I'm going through it fresh because I didn't get a chance as a child to really go through it in a way that I could process different stuff. And so for me, one of the biggest things that I've been dealing with throughout various seasons of my life is having to share my parents with the world. I mean, that's just been tough. And going back through the, 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 the cycle of, wow, I didn't even get a chance to spend that mommy-daughter time. My mother, because it was not just my dad's loss. I lost, because my mom was in the, I mean, she worked within the movement, had a critical role, you know, uh, advising him, doing freedom concerts to raise money for the SELC, was a part of the peace movement herself before he even spoke out against the Vietnam War. But she was there for my first five years. And then suddenly, my extracurricular activities seldom came. And so I'm having to process all of this now, and here's the assassination coming up because it brings all that back up, that daddy was assassinated, mommy had to shift, everything associated with that, having to do this publicly all the time, you know, you know, <laughs> and it's tough, it is tough. For you. April 4th cannot be an easy date every year. Um, how do you deal with that? Well, let, let me just tell you uh, what I have. I first have to acknowledge the loss to my mother of, of her husband and my siblings, our father. That's the very first thing. That was a loss that cannot be replaced. 
But then I look further and I have to gleam and understand that the nation garnered a message and an understanding of a movement. And that is, I mean, for example, you know, if dad had not been killed, I, well, probably we wouldn't be dealing with the things we're dealing with, first, first of all, we'd be at a different place. But had he been killed in a different way, it was the way, the trauma, the traumatic way that he was killed that I think makes his message, his movement, uh, even more lasting. It, I think it would have been lasting regardless uh, because dad was just connected. I mean, I, I, I wish that I had that level of connection that he had um, not just to God, but to the universe and to, to human service. I mean, you say something like if a man hadn't found something worth dying for, he isn't fit to live. And you do it. You know, now, I, I may be willing to die for my child, my wife and my child, but I, I'm not ready to go. I mean, most of us are not. But you have to be very poignant and strong. Figure out, you got to be willing to die for what you believe in. That's when people are very serious. You know, Hosea used to say. Um, Hosea Williams. Williams, I should say. Hosea Williams would say. I know, but for the folks yes, who don't know. Go I ahead. I appreciate you sharing that. You know, he, he, he was looking at a picture, Dan, and, and Hosea Williams was a complex man. He was a chemist, as you may know. Um, but he was an agitator. He was, I mean, he had alcohol problems. He had all kinds of things, all kinds of flaws like we all do as human beings. And he used to attack my mom. And so I was going over there to deal with him and say, now look, now look, you say you love Dr. King, and I'm sure you did, but you're always attacking my mom. Dr. King's vision wasn't about no bricks and mortar. It was about feeding folk. Well, all of that is included. So it, it wasn't, what you're saying is not quite right. But I never got around to saying this because he looked up at this picture of dad above his, his and he said, you know, I, I love your dad. I never met a man like he said he did two significant things. He conquered the love of wealth and the fear of death. I said, my God, say that again. He conquered the love of wealth and the fear of death. Now understand, when you don't really care about money, you, you know things are gonna be all right, and you're not afraid to die, you're unstoppable. And that's the kind of spirit that all of us need if we want to address these critical issues today. Not being afraid of what people are going to say or who's going to follow us. Particularly if you know you're standing on justice. You're standing on the shoulders of, of, of great individuals. Because we've had great people in our, in our nation's history and world. It didn't, it didn't start with Martin Luther King. Martin Luther King Jr. certainly uh, was, was one of our greatest of our time. But, you know, there have been great people going way back who did things with, with nothing. I mean, you go back to think about Harriet Tubman, who said she could have freed more folk if they knew they were slaves. I mean, it, I mean we've had some, I mean, think about Frederick Douglass, I mean, the list goes on, Du Bois, uh, you know, uh, uh, Booker T. Washington, and the list goes on and on with so many, and the inventors, and that's, I mean, we don't really, as black people, honestly, we really don't truly realize who we are. We don't realize we were kings and queens and, and that civilization began on the African continent. Most of us don't realize that because we're taught negativity. Now, I don't know what Black Panther is going to do the movie to change some of that because this has never happened. We've never had an all, almost all black African cast uh, that has charted all past the numbers. I mean, this, that's phenomenal, quite frankly. Everybody's kind of focusing on Martin's assassination. And I've been trying to, to figure out a way to help them to realize that he didn't go nowhere. <laughs> that his body was buried, but his spirit is more alive now in more ways than any of us can ever imagine. And I think I say that there's nothing that I've done uh, that I did on my own. And, but that's, that's the view we held about death. He was never nervous about dying. In fact, he, he, he almost put you into dozens talking about your death. And uh, he would, he made us laugh at death uh, to keep from getting nervous. And he said, look, you're gonna die. Death is the ultimate democracy. And you got nothing to say about when you die, how you die, where you die. 
The only decision you have is what is it you give your life for. And you can do that any day and every day because you know not the day nor the hour. And then he'd switch gears and say, but if your time comes, I know how sorry and trifling you are, but I will. I think on my good day, I could even preach you into heaven. And he would start preaching your, sermon, your, your, your eulogy, bringing up every trifling, ignorant, sinful thing that he could think of and asking the Lord to forgive you and let me in. And he made us laugh at death. And I came back to the motel and they'd been eating catfish and, you know, telling lies and everybody was feeling, they, 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 I mean, this was the happiest I had seen him in years because his brother was there, you know, all of his friends were there practically. And, you know, preachers know how to have fun when they get together. And, I mean, and preachers have fun like preachers have fun. Can't nobody else imitate that or understand it. Because, I mean, they're signifying with each other on, in Bible verses and all that kind of stuff. And, uh, you know, they, they, they have their own language. And... Um, and so I, I stumbled into one of those sessions, and, you know, he said, where have you been? I said, I've been called. You haven't called me all day long. Don't you know I'm the head of this movement? You got to report to me. You think you got? I said, hold on, wait a minute. You talking back to me? I said, look, uh, are you cra y'all? what have y'all been doing in here? See? And then he picked up the pillar, and he threw the pillar. Well, I threw it back. So, and that was like the beginning of a free-for-all. And everybody grabbed pillars, and they all beat me up. <laughs> See? Well, it was fun. But then somebody knocks on, Billy Kyle's knocks on the door and said, my wife is cooking dinner for y'all. And she's waiting, and it's, it's, she's got it all set up on the table. And so he said, well, let me go put on my shirt and tie. And he went upstairs, and uh, put on his coat, shirt, and tie, and he'd just come out, and I said, look, it's still cool. You better get your top coat. And it was almost as though he was saying, I don't need a coat, and he sort of raised his head like he was testing the weather, and then shot rang up. And we all gathered together after we came back from the hospital. And we all decided that uh, you can slay the dreamer, but we will keep the dream alive. Take me to the last conversation you had with him. When was it? The, the last time I had an opportunity to talk with Dr. King was in mid-March. just before he went to Memphis. It was at Pesca's hotel, a restaurant. He had been meeting with a group of rank-and-file members of organization working with low-income or poor people. They were black, white, Latino, Asian American, and Native American. Because he wanted the Poor People's Campaign to look like America. And he kept saying, I will see you in Washington. And he never made it to Washington. The night that uh, he was assassinated, that evening, I was in Indianapolis, Indiana, campaigning with Robert Kennedy, working toward his nomination, the Democratic nomination for president. And when I heard that Dr. King had been shot, I didn't know his condition. When Robert Kennedy came to speak, he said, we have some sad news tonight, that Martin Luther King Jr. had been assassinated in Memphis, Tennessee. So prior to him saying that, 
you didn't realize it. So when every, that audience found out, that's when you found out. That's right. When, when your audience heard the message, I heard it at the same time. And I cried. And I said to myself, well, we still have Bobby. So I went back to Atlanta and helped in preparation for the funeral and stayed there for about two weeks. I got back in the campaign and went to Portland, Oregon and um, with Robert Kennedy. And then I went on to Los Angeles. And I teamed up with Cesar Cervas and we went to these wealthy neighborhoods and homes of primary white citizens, urging them to vote for Bobby Kennedy rather than for Humphrey or Eugene McCarthy. Went to churches. We had an unbelievable motorcade through the city. And there was these black athletes like Rafa Johnson and the big guy, the Rosa Greer. Rosa Greer trying to hold Kennedy in the car. And you saw hundreds and thousands of people, especially in the African-American community, in the Latino community, rallying for Bobby. And he invited me to come to his suite that evening. And he joked with me. He said something like, John, you let me down today. More Mexican-American turnout to vote the Negroes. And he was just joking. But I felt, I truly felt that when Dr. King was assassinated, I said, well, we still have Bobby. In less than two and a half months, he was gone. And I think something died in America with the death of Dr. King and Bobby Kennedy. When I talked to Jim Lawson, I said, in the aftermath of Dr. King's death, what did you do? He said, we went back to work. He said, we had work to do. He said, he did not grieve until July. He said, that's when he just broke down. Um, were you in the same place where there was still work to do? That there was no, that, that was, there was no time to feel sorry? into more. Well, we were caught up in, in the moment. It's, uh, you had to continue to work. We had a major national election coming up. So I didn't mourn that much, but every single day I thought about Dr. King. Um, matter of fact, I went back to Atlanta between the campaigning effort and trying to support others. And my doctor said, you, you need to rest. And made it possible for me to go to the hospital and just rest for about two weeks. And then I got back on the road, supporting local uh, candidates, trying to get people registered, turn people out to vote, uh, became a delegate to the uh, Democratic Convention. That was uh, a, a Julian Bond. We were supporter. Mm -hmm. we, we were challenging the Maddox, Lester Maddox delegation of Georgia. And I had a half a vote in the convention. And uh, I voted for Ted Kennedy uh, in honor of Bobby Kennedy. Yeah, it's a doc. And somebody said, get low, because who, who, it was a hit. And we didn't know what the hit was going to be spring, but it was, I hit the hit. I was on the ground, and the rap was in was in the room. I think brother must have been downstairs. Rap, uh, Billy Kyle's was about so far, trying to go down the steps. And, and there's a picture of Andy, Billy Kyle's, and some of them just for, and they laid a point that way. And that pointing is that the bullet didn't come from that way because he's on the ground. It came from that way. So we tell the police we had their guns wrong. Go to go the way the bullet came from. The, the bullet came from that way. That, that's what, that's the, that picture. Mr. Withers, the, the photographer, he was there, and, and, and he scooped a couple of jars of blood, tried to give me one and wrap one. I, I couldn't touch the blood. I remember Ralph coming back, back, back. My son, my my, my brother, been shot. I'm his, I'm his dearest friend. 
Ralph, uh, Martin, Ma, hold on, we need you. Hold on, hold on. Martin, hold on. But, but I was gone at that point, you know. And so I just got up and ran myself off. And I was standing next door of the room next door. I called Mrs. King. She was in the bed. She said, Jess, how you doing? I said, I'm doing this fine. I said, Mrs. King, uh, couldn't quite get my mouth together. I said, uh, Sam, uh, reading. I said, uh, Doc been shot, I think, in the shoulder. I knew better. I couldn't say what I had just seen. I didn't want to shake up in that way. I said, but you should judge you and see him if you can. She said, I'll be there momentarily. She got up out the bed. And apparently, for seven, eight minutes, someone called, you know, the press and said he was dead. Man, that limb broke out. I mean, the fires around the country. But what excited me the most was, I think it was, it was Reverend, maybe Reverend Joe Lyra that said, you can't let one bullet kill a movement. We went through all the trauma of his death. I remember being in the room with, with Harry Belafonte and Sidney Poitier and Robert Kennedy talking about what Dr. King meant to us. And Doug won't be in Washington and Robert Kennedy. Um, I was at home and my mom woke me up and told me. And I remember her crying and um, when I seen her cry, I started crying. I mean, it just... It just hurt me so bad, and it hurt my household and so bad. It's just, you know, and I remember, I remember seeing the clip, everybody pointing at the, the, the vacant building, and man, and I seen his brother, and it was just like, uh, man, all this blood. I was just, it, it just devastated me. I never forget it. it. Hurt me so bad to my heart, and I felt so bad for the family, Coretta Scott King, those kids. And I just, it devastated me a lot. Yeah, did. When when he when he returned from Mason Temple, uh, did you have any conversations with the folks who were with him about that unbelievable, powerful speech? Were there any were any conversations that night when he got back? Because when we reflect on it now, you, you, you're missing something. You know what you're missing. What's that? <laughs> when he returned, did you have any conversations about what he was missing? He wasn't missing anything because I never left him. Andy never left him. Ralph never left him. We were always a team. We were always a team. We were. That's not a, That's not an exaggeration. But we would. I don't know what it was, but we wouldn't have left him. I'm going to cry. The last conversation you had with him. Right. Last conversation. You wrote, you write it in your book Yeah. that it was the next I, day. I was walking down the street with a, not the street, a pl uh, somebody's balcony with a big plate of fried chicken. <laughs> and you, you wrote in your book that it was April 4th. I don't remember and the days like I'm, I'm gonna walk, whatever the I'm day gonna, was. I'm going to walk you through. It was April 4th. Mm -hmm. And you had a meeting in Atlanta. And you had a meeting with uh, Dolores Harmon. And you said... I got to get back to Atlanta. And Dr. King said, no, we need to talk about plans to training in Memphis. And you said, I got to get to Atlanta. He kept telling you, you can get a later plane. And you said, I got to get back to Atlanta. And you said the last words to him, to you were, get a later plane. And you left Memphis that afternoon. I, I do remember that I had left, but I also remember that I had a big plate of fried chicken from some, somebody's house that, in those days, people would cook for each other. Mm -hmm. And this woman was glad to cook a plate of chicken, and she knew Dr. King was going to eat some of it. Uh, so it's, it, it's uh, he, he, he really loved eating that fried stuff. <laughs> so th there's nothing to talk about except he loved to eat fried chicken. What is it you would want to know? He, I, I brought the chicken to that woman, the, to that house, from another house where they actually did stuff like that. Mm -hmm. You're too young to remember when people were pass, would pass food from house to house. And, uh, not because they needed to, it's because they wanted to. Mm -hmm. oh, serve Dr. King some chicken, you know. So. You were in Atlanta when you found out that he had been killed. Uh -uh. Now, this, this is a very, very hard part for, for me mm -hmm. to, uh, to detail. And 
so it's, uh, I remember somebody, I remember that I had a plate of food uh, that Martin, because he had not had any dinner. And that was the previous day, on April, on April 4th, you were in Atlanta. Well, okay, well, you're, you're reading, so I got to go read my It's book. all good, it's all good. So April 4th, you're in Atlanta, and Rita Samuels tells you that the king shot, somebody yeah. killed him. I need to read that again, because my, my recollection is I went to get this plate of chicken, and I, I don't want to debate about it. Right, right. Just, right, that was April 3rd. That was April 3rd. Yeah. So this is the next day. Yeah. And, I, yeah. And you, I, I don't remember. I'm going to go get my, my copy down. It's all good. I, well, no, it's your copy right here. Yeah. And so um, Andrew Young called you, uh, and y'all talked. Yeah. And you said, I wish I could have been there with him in that last moment, talk with him one more time, showing total support for what we were about. And he said, that's all right. And he was calm and he was consoling you. And you, you, I reflected on what Martin had said to me that morning, get on a later plane. And you said, Andy and I both had an abiding love for Martin. We love him still. We both still cry sometimes as we remember. Yeah, so. Yeah. The closeness I think is what a lot of people don't really understand. How close all of you were. We, it was, it was too late to do anything different. We were close. We were like a, I, I don't know what it is. When you, maybe in the, I don't know, military or somewhere where people get connected and they stay connected. That's not a good al uh, uh, analogy, uh, really, because I remember taking him some food at, the, uh, at that woman's house. And uh, when I took the food, and I'm, I, I got to think about which happened, which happened first, mm -hmm. you know, the shooting or the, did I get the food in his hand and the, you know, things like that. that. Those are not details that I have held on to because I didn't need to. And uh, you're the first one that asked me, you know, uh, about, you know, that I used to talk about. Uh, he was walking down that corridor in the church mm -hmm. uh, with uh, some, uh, staring at that lady's high heel shoes. <laughs> <laughs> do you still miss him? Yeah. Yeah, I do. Probably always will. I was uh, sitting in the kitchen, uh, having something to eat. The radio was on, and I he's so right. Uh, uh, like a lot of people, I guess I was in shock. Excuse me, miss. Can you move down, please? I'm sorry. And I'm weak. And weak. And uh, well, you know, I I I played Martin Luther King on the on the, uh, the stage on Broadway. And uh, so I got a chance to meet the family, spend time with a lot of the family. So it was a very special, well, it was obviously a devastating uh, moment for all of us. Martin King always talked about the fact that he would be shot down in the streets of the nation in the midst of this campaign. He, he, he started talking to us about that actually with the assassination of John F. Kennedy in 60, November of 63. Were it not for a promise you made to your wife, you probably would have been on that balcony. <laughs> well, who knows? Yeah. But y'all were meeting, y'all, I mean, oh, yeah. all, all of yeah. the different... Well, our, as a family, we, we try to eat dinner together each night, so... And you told me, you said, yeah. I'll be home by 6. That's right. We agreed 6 o'clock dinner, and so I was on my way home. I, got, I, I was in the kitchen with Dorothy when we heard the news over a television set that Dr. King had been shot. At 6 or 1. Now I just left him, not too long before that. 
I was stunned when you said we immediately went back to work that you did not really grieve until July. No. You said it, it was the work. That's right. That, yes, that's right. Well, in the midst of, like these terrible times in which we live, doing creative work on behalf of truth and, ju and justice, on behalf of people, on behalf of the wonder of life, on behalf of dissolving sexism and racism, doing work is one of the best ways for us to grieve. So um, I recognize that as a pastor, as a, as a religious person. So um, yes, nine o'clock Friday morning, we marched. And uh, I worked through the night to be sure that we were going to be there. I think I remember being shocked and stunned. You know, um, of course, you know, the passing and the death of, of someone in, in, in the public space was not something that a nine-year-old considers. But I remember being affected by it, that of it having an effect, of, of feeling a sadness, of feeling a loss, even at that age, that it was something you know, it was something huge and looming and, and dark and sad. Um, I think that was the beginning of, you know, what loss looks like. You dropped them off at the airport. And he gets out. As you think back, as you think back, have you, I'm sure you have, have you, just went back and just played every part of that. What he had on, what he said, last look, all of those things. Because that was the last time you saw him alive. Yeah. But let me tell you what happened. The day before uh, I was at their home, um, Mrs. King was convalescing from uh, reaching an illness. And um, she was there, mother-in-law, well, Martin's mother was there, Martin and I. And after dinner, we were playing the piano. He, you know, he's a great singer, and I played the piano. He said, I bet you didn't know I could sing. I said, well, I heard you could. No, I didn't know you could. He said, well, I know you can play. So sit down at the piano. She made you the music in college. Yeah, yeah. So um, we had such fun. Uh, we were singing and, oh, just having a great time. When we we separated the evening ended. I went home and told him I'd pick him up the next morning, whatever time established. But Mama King called me that night about 1130. And she said, you know, I know you're taking ML to the airport tomorrow, but tell him something for me. Said, just like that fun we had today, I'd like to have more days like that. I know I'm the mother and I have to understand he's busy, but you see to it and tell him I want him to plan more fun time for family hour. Will you do that for me? I said, of course. Well, I told him. I said, now your mother called me and I told her she, she wants more, more of your time and we're going to see that you do that. Well, guess what? About four, three or four o'clock Atlanta time, because uh, Memphis was an hour behind us, he called her talked to her about an hour and a half. She said it never happened before. Could you take your mother for granted? He knew she was going to be there. She was supportive of her. The son loved him dearly. But he didn't bother to call her. But when I saw her that first time that night, because I went over to check on them, she said, listen, when this pain subsides a little bit. I'm going to tell you how much I appreciate what you did. Because he told me you told him what I said. And that prompted him to call. And they had a big laugh about, you know, here's the call. And um, he knew, I think, because he called his brother. He had never done that before. Called him on the phone, I understand, talked a good time with him. He did a lot of odd things. I talked to him, and he said to me, uh, why does my room number sound so familiar to you? I mean, to me, he said. 
And I said, oh, no, because I don't know what room you're in, because he knew we'd switched hotels. And he said, it's 306. And I said, well, that's my house number. And I said, you've been here enough, so I guess you make a new relationship. And I said, oh. That all of these things were odd things that happened that day. April 4th. Uh-huh. It was early in the day that uh, he called me. And, um, and then he called his mother, called his brother, and Andy said they were playing pill talk, I mean, a pillow throwing, whatever. After he came back from court, yeah, came in and, and they played, had a pillow fight. Uh-huh, yeah. And so he did a lot of things uh, that day that were unusual, I understand. I wasn't there, I was here. Uh, but he did a lot of unusual things, a lot of unusual things. Oh, i tell you something else that was most unusual. Coretta's favorite uh, gift is red roses. And every birthday, her birthday's in April. Uh, April uh, 27th is her birthday. Um, now, he left on, was, was March, I guess, when he left Atlanta. Mm -hmm. uh, he bought her some artificial flowers and left them in the library of the house. And he told her to go get the flowers. And uh, no, he, he told the housekeeper to tell her when he leaves, go get those flowers out of the library. She was angry. She, he said, did you get those roses? So she said, yes, but I'm mad about it. She said, why? He said, because they're artificial. And guess what he said to her? I didn't know whether I would be here on your birthday or not, but I wanted your roses to be here. Now, he died. That was April 4th. Well, that was April 3rd when he talked to her. Her birthday is April 27th. Mm. He said, I don't know whether I would be there in person for your birthday, so, but here are your red roses. You know, she kept those roses a long time. Mm -hmm. 6.01 p.m., April 4th. Shots ring out. How do you find out? I was having dinner with the Grand Dragon of the Ku Klux Klan. And the Mater D knew my relationship with the Kings, and she came over to the table and gave me a note. Well, we were talking. I was busy talking. And she said, did you hear about Dr. King? And I just folded up the note and kept talking. She thought that was odd. She came back a second and she said, I hate to interrupt your meal. She said, but I just heard on the radio he'd been shot. Well, that didn't bother me either because I'd been in his presence before when it was reported. We were in Los Angeles once that we reported that he had been shot. And we were in there getting ready for a nice, comfortable evening and a meal. Well, not just he and I, but, you know, several of us were. Again, we had a big laugh about it that they said, I think the guy had had eight sticks of dynamite and said, I think I got him, you know. We saw it on TV. So I didn't think anything about it. I just talked to him earlier that hopes. day. And, you know, so he was all right then. And I said, well, maybe I better go to the phone. I went to the telephone and their private lines were busy. And that's unusual, all the lines to be busy. And I said uh, to my guests, I think I better go over there. So I then drove over and as I was getting to her driveway, she was backing out. The mayor was there and the police. They were taking her to the airport. And she said, oh, I've been trying. She left the window down. It was raining. She said, I've been trying to reach you. Uh, I've got to go to Memphis, said. And um, she had a housekeeping staff, but she knew I had a special relationship with the children. She said, will you check on the children for me. I don't know what's going to happen. Because, see, when they called her, they didn't, <clears throat> they didn't tell her he was killed. They told her been shot and injured. So when you're driving up, you still think it's not true? Well, I think something must have happened in order for the mayor and the police right. Once to Right. That's what I said. I but as you're driving happened. over, you're going, okay, we've heard this before. Let me drive over. Yeah, right. Mm -hmm. But then yeah. when you turn that corner and then you see yeah. police and the mayor, that's when it hits you. Just something, okay, something, something happened. Something did happen. Mm -hmm. And so <clears throat> you pull up, she rolls the window down, but she doesn't know that he's gone. That's right. She didn't know. And it wasn't until she got to the airport that she got the call that, and I think the mayor got the call, that he is gone. And so um, Martin's secretary was there at the airport to join her. And they went to the ladies' room, and that's when she got the real official word. And then she came back home. Mm -hmm. 
So you're in the house with the children. And I stayed. I didn't leave there until five days later, six days later. Mm -hmm. You know he's gone. Did you wait for her to return to tell them, or were they made aware, the children? Oh, I would never, not even consider telling the children. Um, she came shortly, shortly, I guess, you know, after, well, I guess they could speed, but she came, it didn't take her long to get to the house, and she came in telling her staff and everybody, and by now, the house is filling up, because everybody else now has heard. But she said to her staff, do not tell my children. I'll do that myself. And so her bedroom was at the end of the long hall in the house. So she decided to make that her solace. And then people up front would answer the phone and then direct the call back uh, to see if she would take it out and be the interceptor. I just stayed with her. But she got ready to go tell the boys and she asked me to go with her. And she had a death grip on my arm, I mean, tightly, trying to tell the children. She told Dexter first, the younger boy, that, you know, your dad has been seriously hurt. She couldn't bring herself to, she couldn't bring herself to say. She said, uh, your dad has been hurt. Well, how badly is he hurt? She said, pretty badly, I understand. Um, but um, um, we'll talk about it later, but, you know, he's not coming home, and uh, I've got a lot of things to do. And he finally, he said, well, if he's hurt, but he jumped out of his bed, he said, if he's hurt badly, why are you still here? You all do everything together. Why are you still here? And he was chastising her. And she said, oh, well, you know, got a lot of decisions to make. And she was calm and still holding me so tightly. And then we went to the other side of the room, which was the other boy's side, Martin. And she told him, oh, he was older, so she said, uh, he's, it's pretty serious. And um, so we got a lot of decisions to make. I don't know what we're going to do first, but it looks like he's very, very serious. She still can't say. She couldn't say it. She couldn't say it. And he said, um, well, what must I tell my children, I mean, my friends at school tomorrow? So she said, well, you know, you're not going to go to school, uh, so you won't have to worry about that. And he leaped up. What do you mean? I have to go to school. Miss Davis said there'll be no cutting her classes. And I, I laughed later, not at that moment, but I said, oh, that teacher put fear in those kids, you know, <laughs> cutting these classes. But uh, she finally got out of the room. And, and then she had a sigh of relief, you know, that she finally told them. Now, Bernice was too little. She was only like four, I think, and didn't understand. But Yolanda came in, and she sat on her mother's bed right beside her, and they embraced, crying, like, we're big girls. We're not going to cry. Daddy wouldn't want us to cry, so we're not going to cry, Mommy. We're going to pull this thing together. The two of us can do this, and they are wailing. The most poignant moment, that was a difficult moment for me, and I guess I was crying too, because they were just embracing tightly, saying, we're not going to cry. We're not going to cry. Um, but what, so they finally said, okay, we're going we're gonna to work this thing out. As the calls were coming in, they would assume Mrs. King would want to talk to the president. Um, and so, you, you know his voice, so I would take the call and said, okay, Mrs. King, this is President Johnson. But what was interesting, everybody had the same message. And it's the same one maybe you and I make, like someone dies and said, if I can do anything, let me know. And meeting it, you know, anything you need me to do, let me know. If there's anything I can do, mm -hmm. everybody had the same message except one call. Kennedy, um, Robert, Robert Kennedy. Kennedy. His call was the one that was different. He said, Mrs. King, it's obvious. Now, when he called, 
it was now see in Atlanta it was about five or six ish, uh, and people started calling, and uh, so up until now it's almost ten. Mr. Kennedy said, um, "It's obvious, Mrs. King, that um, you need more telephone lines because I've been trying to get you ever since the news broke." But Mr. and I'll make up a name because I don't remember the name. But Mr. John Jones is en route to Atlanta now to install nine telephone lines for you. He'll be there at 12:30 tonight. He's en route now. I also heard on the TV that you'd perhaps want to go pick your husband up in Memphis. So we've dispatched a plane. It's already there in Atlanta. The pilot's name is Sam Smith. Uh, tailgate number one two three four five. Telephone number eight two two zero zero one. So whenever you want to go, all you have to do is make this call. He will take you, and he's in readiness whenever you want to go to Memphis. Also, who's your point person? And she told I was going to be her lead spokesperson. And he said, Zernona, call every hotel in the city of Atlanta. Talk to the management and put a clamp on all the rooms in the hotel, I mean in the city, that People will be coming to this room who are heads of states, and we got to be sure we have the right allocation of space. And my team will be there tomorrow morning, and we're going to set up an office at 123 Maple Street, and we will help govern things. And he just jump, 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 lay everything out. And we followed his rules. I mean, Cause his. Because he, he had been through it. Mm -hmm. He said, we know how, we've got experience in this. We know what we're doing. And he was right. Yeah. And I was there when uh, Jacqueline Kennedy came, which was the expected moment. Two, two things happened. I mean, you got time for me to tell all yeah. this? Uh, before I tell you about Mrs. Kennedy, I'm going to tell you about Nixon. He was the, he wasn't president at that point. He was the... Republican candidate. Yeah, the candidate mm -hmm. for Republican. He called our newspaper publisher and said, I know Dr. King's feelings on me, but do you think you could help arrange for me to come uh, visit Mrs. King? My wife and I want to come make a call on her. And he said, no, I can't do it, but I've got a very good friend who's at her house, and he was talking about me. And she will tell me whether you can or not. So let me get in touch with her, and then I'll call you back. So he called me, and I said, I don't know. I have to run it by her. Well, when I told her that in the house there were people who said, oh, no, you know, Dr. King would want to see him. And, uh, and so they talked to her, saying, no, why don't you say no? Well, I had her last ear. So I said, Mrs. King, this is not a time for politics. Why don't you let him come? But let's lay some ground rules. Mm -hmm. No entourages, no press, no nothing. Just come. If he's making a personal call, then he personally can call on her. So she bought my advice and agreed. I called Mr. McGill and told him and said we wanted him to come unannounced. And sure enough, he came. But guess what happened? He drove, he came up, and we knew what time. They told us all the way. He's at the airport now. He's on his way. So we knew when to expect him. And when he came here, I went to the door, the front of the house. He came in a beige, I don't know, cars, but like also a Chevrolet, something like that. It wasn't a fancy, like, I don't want to offend anybody, but it was a small <laughs> car. And um, I ushered him in. Well, he was by himself, but he said, you know, Mrs. Nixon was coming. But he said they got a call that one of the girls got sick and she had to rush to New York. He said, but, so he sat by her bed. Wait, that's where she received her get. She said, on her bed, we had a chair, and he sat there face to face. And he knew how Dr. King felt. He said, but this is not a political call. My wife and I were coming, and he went on to tell why she knew him. He said, I have brought with me a check, a personal check, that we are feeling um, the grief, and because we are Americans, we have to take some responsibility for this. 
So as our personal expression of sympathy, we want to educate all four of your children. And this check that we have here will cover their expenses wherever they go. There's enough money to educate all four children. Everybody knows that story because I haven't told it for a few times. Then we were told that Mrs. Kennedy was coming and then the day she was due, she said she couldn't make it. Then we got another call. She said now she does want to come. She said I don't have the strength to make it. Because she was had she had to release she, she knew the pain of Coretta Scott King. You get my script ahead of me, because what happened is she finally came. And as I said, you know, describing you can get the picture of the house. The front door was up there. Coretta's bedroom was at the end of the hall. When she came, they told me she was here, so I went to greet her to bring her back. Roland, those two women didn't say one word to each other, verbal word, no word. Neither said hello. They didn't say anything. They embraced. That seemed like 20 minutes. Of course, it wasn't that long. But they embraced without a spoken word for an endless period of time. But you don't have to be smart to read their lips and their heart. The heart was saying, we know what, what you're feeling. You know, I know, we know. That was the most poignant moment, and it was the one time that I cried because I was feeling their language. Now, it has me hard for you because here you are. You go to the home. You're with the kids. She comes back. She asks you to be with her when she tells the children. You have to be her rock. Oh, yeah. So you, you can't grieve. You, you can't break down. You can't. You're taking the phone calls. You're doing. So how are you? Did you just sort of just go like kid at Robert Candy? You just went right into work mode? Oh, yeah. Because... I, you know, I'm, I'm not even sure that I ever cried, come to think of it, I'm saying later, but I never got a chance to grieve uh, because one of the things when she was trying to decide whether she's going to go to Memphis and, you know, then right away I said, oh, gee, she needs clothes because I wanted her to look nice. She's going to be photographed wherever she goes. So the, the next morning now we were up, or well, the, the night went into morning. So by morning time, I told her I was going to go down and get some clothes. And um, I did. I went to a little nice little shop downtown Atlanta um, that had nice clothing. And I told the man that I've come to pick some things for Mrs. King. I have no money. Uh, I wouldn't dare take time to ask her for a credit card. And I don't have any money, so will you trust me to pick what I think she wants, take it home, and if she likes them, we'll keep them, and I'll come back and pay it, and I'll bring the clothing back. And he agreed to those terms. Well, I picked out a lot of stuff, came home. As I was getting into the house, I had a man there who helped me because I had all these clothing. In the lobby, I mean, in the foyer of their home, were Bella Fonte and Stan Levinson. And Stan Levinson was the Jewish friend who'd mm -hmm. been with them a long time. Very close advisor, Dr. Uh -huh, King. Exactly. And uh, said, what are you doing? I said, oh, well, I wanted to look nice, so I bought a lot of clothes. And I told them the story. I didn't have no money. And they said, well, we want her to look nice, too, and we know you know what she would look good in. They both gave me a credit card. I said, here, we don't care what you buy. Buy what you think you want for her. Here are the cards to pay for them. So when I came home, when I saw her uh, later on, um, after the, the people subsided, um, she looked at my stuff and liked everything I brought. And I said, oh, I can go back empty head. <laughs> so I said, and I told her the story. I had money. Because she said, to give me her credit card. I said, oh, no, I got two credit cards. <laughs> I went back, and guess what the owner of the store said? Um, mm, you got a balance here? 
I thought he had lost his mind. <laughs> I'm the same one who just left you with all your clothes. And he said to me, I have come to pay for them. He said, listen, I'm a white man in America. And I have to take some of the responsibility of having the climate that created this. So the least I can do is cover the cost of the clothing. You have a zero balance. You know. And I had also designed her headdress and uh, had gone down to um, our department store, which was Macy's at the time. And um, we had a laugh because they asked me what time was I coming. And I said, well, I don't know. Uh, I was so busy, I don't, I don't have a schedule. I don't know. He said, well, it doesn't matter. We'll stay here till you get here. The store closes at 5. So if you're not here, I said, can you find the back door? And I laughed. I said, I'm black. I know where all the back <laughs> doors are. <laughs> so he said, if you leave the back door open, I can come through the back door. Sure, if that's where, because the store was closed, I went through the back door and told the lady, this is what I think I want. I had never designed anything either, so I said, this is what I think I want. Um, and so uh, the lady agreed uh, to you know, do it up, and I said, and don't stitch it, just kind of baste it so, you know, she's got to approve it and she may not like it. And um, it was the time except for when Yolanda, the daughter, came in and I saw her cry. She never shed a tear. That woman was just strong, making decisions and moving, never cried out after the, that. But when she tried on the headdress, then, she looked in the mirror, and I'm sure she's saying, now, this is what I'm wearing to my husband's funeral. And she broke down that time. But those are the only times she cried the whole time, in that whole long week, it was a week long. Um, that was the week that was, I'll just call it that. And they say rose in a fist of glove. Mm -hmm. When you went to the airport, you accompanied her to the airport? when his body was returned from? No. No. Oh, I didn't see the body until, uh, let me tell you that story, because the day he was ready for viewing, because uh, I've been doing a myriad of things, you know, um, while they had announced that there was going to be a public viewing at 11 o'clock, um, at that moment, we were at the church. Uh, Coretta had to make some final uh, revisions to the program. Um, and so she went over to the church, and the security guard called her over there to say, Miss King, what must we do? Said, there are thousands of people lined up here to see the body. And so what must we do? And she said, oh. And it had begun a misting rain. And the, you know, the worst kind of rain is a, a mist. It just falling on you. Uh, she was such a kind, considerate, compassionate woman. She said, oh, well, let him, let him go on in. And I said, no, Coretta, you should see him first. And I said, the, the public will wait, but you need to see him first. And what good advice that was, because once we finished the church, we went over to view. And I was, you know, Harry Belafonte and his wife, and I were the only non-family members, everybody else, it's a large family. And I saw them when, he, when they came in, I stepped aside and Coretta came down and she had a faint, a faint response, oh, like she was gonna collapse. When I walked up to the beer, he looked awful. It looked as if someone had gone and just dug up a big glob of clay and whoop, slapped it upside his face. I was horrified. So I stepped over quietly to the mortician and said, sir, is there anything you can do to the side of his face? He crashly said, miss, his jaw was blown up. That's the best I could do. I was shocked. Loudly in the Loudly. presence? Coretta didn't the only thing could hear. Oh, I was so, so angry with him. And I finally said, forget him. And I said, something has to be done because he looked horrible. I mean, this big old glob of stuff. 
And um, so Coretta and I, they're sitting down. Oh. And I looked at Mama King, that's the mother, who's dark-skinned. And then I saw Belafonte's wife, who was white. And I, uh, back in those years, women always carried loose powder. And I was hoping that's, that they had some. And I said, Mama King, you got any powder? She said, oh, yeah. She gave me her powder, which was dark. Julie, do you have some? And she said, yes. Hers was white. So I took the two and stood over the casket, looking at Martin's face and making myself a little roux of a mixture. Belafonte came over, took his handkerchief, and put it around Martin's neck. And so I'm dabbing to see what I've got here, trying to match the other side of his face to get a balance to it. And I finally got it, and Coretta smiled. And so I'm brushing the excess off of Martin's face, and Belafonte, and I never knew what happened to the handkerchief. It was his handkerchief he had taken out of his pocket. Um, and the excess, you know, we folded it up. But he was to stay there till midnight, and then we were moving him to the church uh, for another viewing at 3 a.m. And so I did it again because the body oxidizes with air. And uh, so I went and did it again. So I did it three times uh, before the actual funeral. Martin Luther King, I believe at least a year before he was assassinated, began to understand that he had gone so far that it would be almost impossible for him to escape danger, if not death. And so we began to talk about it. Uh, and up until the very end, he, uh, when that last night at the Memphis uh, at the Memphis meeting of garbage workers, when he, he said he was ready, that's the way Christians like that think about life. They want to be ready when the time comes. And I think he was preparing himself. And yes, uh, when he branched out into the Vietnam War and that criticism, when the Poor People's March did not materialize in the way he thought, thought it would, and even then people thought he was out of his element, uh, he began to understand that he was accumulating en enemies uh, in what we then call the power structure from all over the country and all over the world. And here is where, why I believe that Martin Luther King probably died at peace because he had prepared himself for death. Describe for you April 4th, 1968. Where were you? What were you doing that day? I'll never forget that day. I, I, believe, uh, I, I remember, I, I think I almost woke up to it, to learn of it. And as much as we had learned of his, of his encounters with danger, I have to tell you, Roland, assassination, I was not prepared for. I was young and married and just I had my first child, and, and uh, you know, for me, the Civil Rights Movement would go on or some version of it forever. Yes, I knew King was in danger. Um, and yes, Malcolm X had been assassinated. Mm -hmm. What I did not understand is that I was in the decade of assassinations, where when people disagreed with you, they would kill you. Kennedy. Malcolm X, MLK, JFK, Magger Evers. Think about it. And it, it. That's five and five years. Of one decade. And what is not coincidental is that if you look at the decades of the 20th century, none was more robust in change. And in change, that brought results. It was as if the country had a cataclysm. A lot of change, a lot of reaction. It was a strange period, Roland. See, that, see, that started for me, that strangeness and that unbelievableness that, um, that was happening uh, to a lot of our political figures in those days uh, started to me with the assassination of John Kennedy. Mm -hmm. You know, I never will forget that day in my life or, either, or any of those days. Um, because I was actually uh, on my way to a business meeting when they 
came on the radio and interrupted and said they, they, at that time they were just saying they thought he was dead, but he had been shot in Dallas. And I'm thinking, my God, this is the 20th century, and this is the United States of America. And you mean to tell me our president can be assassinated? I mean, back in the days of Lincoln, and but okay, fine, it was, you know, but not in the 20th century, with all the protection and all the all the, the pre-planning for his routes and all the stuff like that. That they, he could be assassinated. That was mm -hmm. unbelievable to me. I actually saw Robert Kennedy get assassinated on TV. I was watching that night, you know. So Martin Luther King, now. For Martin Luther King, who was the, uh, who was Martin Luther King? Martin Luther King was the, 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 the main uh, warrior for the black people, as far as I'm concerned at that time, you know. Uh, I wasn't as surprised that they killed him as I was when they killed Malcolm X. You know what I mean? I wasn't a surprise because Martin was into a lot of stuff that a lot of people, bigots, hated. Mm -hmm. He was a marked man. I didn't expect it. I didn't, I, I was hoping that it would never come to that, you know what I mean? But it did not surprise me because of who he was and what he was doing. You know, horrible day. Horrible, just, oh man, here we go again. Where were you? I don't even know where I was. I was in oblivion. That's where I was <laughs> after that. I don't know where I was. But it was just, here we go again. When is this going to, um, what, what's safe? Who's, who's safe? You know what I mean? We're April dead. 4th. What were you doing that day? Uh, what was the day like? Oh, yeah. Every day was a day of, of mobilization. Uh, we would uh, meet with the men to the, if there was any progress. We'd report on what that was. If there were any unusual things happening, fill them in on that. If there were any questions they had or decisions they need to make, to try and get that done. Uh, but everybody was mobilizing for the march. But you also had a court hearing that day, if I'm correct. Yeah, that was, an, that was a series of injunctions. But SCLC uh, took responsibility for dealing with the injunctions. Andrew Young and James Orange and Oh, some of the other fellows and their law lawyers took responsibility for the court because the, the, the court had enjoined uh, the march. Mm -hmm. uh, it had not enjoined the mobilization and community action work that we were doing. So that day goes along. You go throughout the day. You get to the evening. Where are you? I'm at the uh, headquarters building of the, what was called then the minimum salary to bu uh, building of the AME Church, uh, which is the building next door to where our mobilizing headquarters were, which was Cleveland Temple. Um, in the evening, I, I lose track of the time, but the word came over the radio uh, that Dr. King had been shot on the balcony at the Lorraine Motel. And uh, among all the unbelievable things that you just refused to accept, uh, this was one of them. So, so, so you hear this on the radio. So a co-staffer and myself, we were like five minutes from the Lorraine Motel. Uh, we jump in the car and we come around here. And by the time we get here, uh, police were already here, uh, keeping people out uh, as, as opposed to keeping people in. And uh, the, 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 this whole evening, uh, it was just one that we had difficulty believing. Um, Dr. King, as, as prominent a leader as he was, uh, to be shot on the balcony made no sense to us at all. Uh, it was not like he was a stranger in town, should have and perhaps did have as much security as you could have. Uh, but the, the, the evening ended uh, with not only with the shooting, but with him being taken to the hospital, uh, our responsibility then was to make sure that nobody else was injured. I mean, the city obviously was just outraged, and uh, our job was to make sure that the people, A, uh, got home all right, uh, didn't confront uh, 
the police or anybody else with any any activities that would cause there to be more harm. Uh, and then to reconvene a meeting of all the partners in this thing to talk about where do we go from here. You get word that he's died. Where are you and how do you react? Um, you know, personally, it was an incredible level of sadness. Uh, uh, it was not like you had a leader who preached violence. Uh, you had probably one of the most committed men to nonviolence, yet to be killed as a violent act. Um, we, we were a little, uh, we had to think through what this all meant. Uh, Oh, how and what do we do with the men the next day? Uh, how do we handle the notification across the country uh, as to what was taking place in Memphis? And at least whatever advice we were going to give to other folks, uh, how they should react. And uh, clearly, uh, the, the country was beginning to go up in smoke. Uh, you know, the anger uh, that was across their major urban areas mm -hmm. was just incredible. I interviewed Reverend Jim Lawson, and he said the next day he went to, went to work. He said, we literally did not have time to stop. And he said it wasn't until either July or August that the grief hit him. Mm. He said, but literally, he, st he was completely in work mode. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I think that's typical of everybody, and certainly Jim, who was such a major part uh, of this. Uh, we had 1,300 men, 1,300 families. Who knows how many children that were a part of all this. We had a community by now that was totally mobilized in support of them. Uh, there needed to be direction given. There needed to be a conversation with the leaders. Uh, there needed to be uh, addressing the young people, uh, many of whom had become reluctant supporters of the strike, but they were supporters. Uh, we had to at least make sure that no one uh, gave reason for added violence against any community members. Um, and to try as best as we could to prepare for what ultimately became a major march on behalf of Dr. King himself. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, we were getting deluged with calls from all over the country of people who really want to know, is it real, is it true, is it, et cetera. Uh, I just think I remember a call from Byatt Rustin, uh, who was on a radio show in Westchester County someplace, where people were equally out upset and I think Byron mentioned on the radio, if you want to do something to help people in Memphis, you know, send a dollar. And uh, the outpouring of concern and support in a day or so we felt down here where there was duffel bags, you know, army duffel bags filled with dollar bills that people mm. were so impacted by this. Uh, but as Jim said, we, we, we didn't have time to stop. Uh, we almost went, into, went from his death mode to mobilize and for this major march that uh, we, we had, we got committed to. And I believe we had 40 or 45,000 people uh, show up for that march. Uh, we had to deal with what was going to take place in Atlanta. Uh, and to their credit, uh, the, the men, while they regretted and was suddenly upset by Dr. King's uh, assassination, they remained committed to their goal. Uh, and they, they organized themselves, they made their own decisions about how they would respond on a city basis. I can remember we were real concerned about whether or not we wanted to take the marches back downtown. Uh, a minister here in town whose name may be lost in all of history, Reverend Henry Starks, who took just personal responsibility for organizing and mobilizing the march to dramatize to the business community and certainly to the city leadership, that these women were committed to this. And we, we would, I think we wanted to take a day off, but the men asked us, aren't we going back downtown? 
aren't we going to march today? Um, and for those of us who were staff, you know, we, we had to really not only pick ourselves up, uh, but to try and understand that, you know, this is a tragedy that happened in the course of a major movement mm -hmm. uh, and understand that Dr. King was certainly aware of the risk, uh, but he is also committed to the... Well, I, it's, it's kind of hard to describe because I was a single dad at the time and my boys. To me, it was just such a, a loss of... I don't want to say hope because that's not quite it, but the possibilities that that, that could happen. I had just done the Martin Luther King story with Paul Winfield and Sister Tyson a few years before, and uh, and it was just devastating. I was uh, I was in Detroit and um, trying to sit my kids down and say this doesn't change the possibilities. It's just very hard. It's just very devastating, and it was the whole town. I remember was just. I don't know, it was just like the wind that was just taken out of everything. What should folks, we're going to commemorate it, but what should folks do April 5th this year? Because folks, we have these events and people remember things on those lines, but what should be the call to action? Well, I think the real call for action, as far as I'm concerned, is stepping toward the things that we want. As I know we keep uh, fighting for the things that we're opposed to, and we have to be aware, and I don't take any of that away. But I think now it's about being an example and reaching out to each other, which is why this is, tonight is so important to be a part of the community, to be uh, embraced by our own community. So I really hope uh, that we will remember to, to include each other because we have a way sometimes of getting a little exclusive. And I don't think that's what King was about or his legacy was about, but we really need to include each other. We get really caught up in a lot of diversity. That's a wonderful thing. But for us, I think we need to, to embrace our brothers and sisters. I had finished shaving and was, and was standing on the balcony, and there was some staff down on the, on the ground. And Raph, they were, Raph was putting aftershave, Aramis aftershave on, when he heard what he said sounded like a firecracker. And then he looked down and saw the soles of modern shoes. And he ran outside. And uh, the staff was up crying and all carrying on. And he said, stop acting like sissies. Call the ambulance. Call the ambulance. You don't have time to cry. Call the ambulance. And he called the ambulance. And when they got there, the ambulance came. And um, they got in. Ralph got in and took him on, took Martin on to the hospital. And Ralph <clears throat> said to Martin, he grabbed his head. He said, Ralph. Martin, this is Ralph, this is Ralph, this is Ralph. And he grabbed him up and held him. And he said, Martin whispered to him, please, Ralph, take my people forward. And Ralph said, oh, Martin, oh, Martin, oh, Martin. And he never said another word. He was gone. Oh, wow. When they said that mine had been shot, Coretta called me and said, Juanita, we always kept a bag packed because we never knew when we were going to have to move instantaneously. So she said, <clears throat> mine had been shot and um, we need to go to Memphis. I said, okay, I'll meet you at the airport. And as we turned into the airport, they announced Martin Luther King just died. And my little children were in the back, and they just started screaming and hollering, oh, Uncle Martin is dead, Uncle Martin is dead, Uncle Martin is dead. Oh, what about Yoki? What about Yoki? Because my daughter and Yoki were like, you know, they were in, in, they were in diapers together. So they were each other's first friends. So we got there, and the chief of police and everybody was around Coretta. And because uh, I told you we were getting ready to go to Memphis. And I said to her, I said, well, Coretta, I'll meet you back at your house. 
So I left there and went on to her house. And I stayed there that night. And um, I said, well, Coretta is, you know, what are we going to do? I said, I'm just so glad Ralph was not there. I said, because they would have gotten two at the same time. They would have gotten both of them. I don't remember grieving at all. This was what you always expected, all right? But you knew also that that wasn't going to end the struggle. And it's the struggle that you were concerned about. And you were the struggle that Martin was concerned about. It was... Uh, 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 that's what it was all about, right? Is that it wasn't about, uh, well, Martin is dead, and so let's go home. And uh, that's nonsense. You would work harder because you didn't have uh, a Martin King. We knew that uh, 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 everything was going to change. Describe for you April 4th, 1968. What were you doing that day? Where were you? April 4th, 1968, I had, uh, I was in my office in Wall Street and I was uh, leaving early because I was uh, preparing to go down to uh, Memphis, Tennessee. I had already talked to Martin earlier and to um, Bernard Lee uh, mm -hmm. and Andy about the logistics, about I want to be sure that you're going to have somebody meet me at the airport so you can take me directly to the place where he was speaking. Okay. So I'm rushing to go to the airport. And the phone rings. And I said, I don't answer the phone. And something said, I don't know. I said, answer the phone. So I picked up the phone. And it's Harry Belafonte. I said, Harry, I can't talk to you. I'm rushing to the airport. I'm going down to see Martin now. He said, you got your television? I said, no. I said, rushing there. He says, Martin's been shot. I said, what? So I turned on the television, and there, that's all it is. Martin Luther King Jr. has been shot, you know? I get on the phone, I can't reach anybody, all the lines are busy, I can't reach uh, Billy Kyles, I can't reach, I can't reach anybody, can't reach Bernard, I can't reach anybody, I can't have anybody meet me, meet me, me. And I'm trying to decide uh, what to do, and the phone rings again, you know? I wouldn't even pan to the television. I just, I, the television's in another room, and I'm trying to get through on the phone. Harry Belafonte, he says, Martin's dead. And he says to me, well, uh, what are you going to do? And I said, Harry, well, what do you think I should do? He said, I don't think you should. Harry says, I don't think you should go. I said, we should get some more information. I don't think you should go. So I hang up the phone. And the very first thing that came into my mind was they finally got him. They finally got him. Sometime sometime our book ended. Sometime between April fourth, nineteen sixty seven and April fourth, nineteen sixty eight, I had come to the conclusion that it was not a question of whether Martin King would be assassinated. Uh, it was only when, and I discussed it very closely with Stanley Levison. And he said, well, this has always been a danger. I know, I said, no, Stanley, you don't understand. Something new has happened. He said, yeah, I, I agree. No, I was, I was really, I was really, I was, I was, you know, also angry, but, and so when that happened, they finally got him. Within that same thought, Roland, you, you, you know, your family, I can tell you. I wondered to myself, I said, I don't think I can stay in this country. It's fine, it's fine. I'm having a conversation. Mm -hmm. No, I can't stay in this country. This, I'm with Clarence Jones. I, said, no. I can't stay in this country. The anger was so seething, you know. 
and I was, I was drinking more heavily than I drink today. You know, I was drinking, you know, martinis and traveling the the, the south. I was drinking my Jack Daniels and so <laughs> forth. You know, hanging out. Orzel Billingsley, you know, you couldn't have a conversation with Orzel Billingsley unless you drank. You know? <laughs> so, so I was, I was just, the anger was just beyond. I had made a, I had made a personal judgment. I said, Clarence, uh, you have to leave this country. That's what I'm talking to myself. I said this to the Harry. I said, Harry, I can't stay here. So why? I said, because I can't, I don't think I have the discipline. I said, I was afraid. Of, I mean, I, I had such crazy things like I was 37 years old. He was 39, okay? And I'm thinking to myself, as you know, I hear about all these bad guys in the Blackstone Rangers and how they're going to do this. I said, I, but I was trained in a special forces unit. <laughs> you know? I said, all these talk about, I said, I really know how to kill. I mean, this is the way this really is. I, I mean, I was, I really know how to kill a person 10 different ways. You know, that's the way I be. I was trained to do that. And I thought to myself, I ought to figure out how to get in touch with some of the guys that were in the army with me. I said, this is the stuff. You asked me this question. I began to think crazy things. I began to think crazy things. I think, you know, maybe I ought to, maybe I ought to go out and talk to the so help me God. Maybe I should go out and talk to the Blackstone Rain and so forth. I said, you know, they're probably going to see me in my suit. They're going to say, who are you? But when I finished talking to them, I said, no, all you guys are walking around bad with your little guns and so forth. You don't have to do a damn thing. I said, what you need to do, I mean, this is the way I was thinking. I said, I need to, I need to think whether or not, and you know, I mean, you, I mean, I was influenced by Che Guevara in my writings. I was, you know, all these things. I mean, Che Guevara could do it, and Castro can do it, you know, and and if, uh, and if, uh, Ahmed Mandela could, I was sort of going through the, you know, I was going through all the liberation people. I mean, mm -hmm. I mean, it's sort of crazy. Like, who am I, this, this middle class uh, educated lawyer? But I had some training. I mean, I was training. And so I said, I said, that's what we need to do. I said, everybody else is out there selling whoop tickets because they don't know how to do it. They, I said, they don't really know how to kill, but I know how to kill. And that, so help me God. And, so I, and I said, I'm going to see if I can beat. And then when, then I began to, when I began to think of myself, I said, I can't believe that I'm thinking this way. Okay? And I shared it, I shared a little bit of that with, uh, uh, Harry Belafonte and another fellow, a good friend of mine, out in, uh, I told Al Sampson and Benny Johnson in Chicago, you know. Go, Benny said, "Calm down, calm down." He said, "If you want to meet, if you want to sit with the Blackstone Rangers and so forth." So, so I had to. I, I went I, uh, after the funeral. Go for I had to get out. I think I went to France and Italy for a little while. But the anger was so intense. It was so intense. They finally got him. Now, by the way, February 15th, I'm sitting with James Comey in his office, former FBI director. I'm sitting with him for about an hour. I got some nice pictures with him. And, and, and finally, after we talk about the FBI and so forth, and I said, uh, the last 10 or 15 minutes we're together, it's like, there's a big long table between us. He's sitting over here and I'm sitting here. And I said, you know, Mr. Director, he says, call me James. I said, well, Mr. Director, I said, there's one thing I want to talk to you before I go. I said, it's about the assassination of Martin Luther King Jr. I said, uh, I know the, uh, the Warren Commission, some kind of commission, you have these files. And I think maybe some of the files are not even going to be opened up until a later date. And I said, you don't have to say anything. I said, I just want to tell you something. I said, no. You know, some of the King children went into the prison and they actually talked to James O'Ray and uh, one of them, Dexter, so they, they said, no, I don't believe he killed my father, you know. Well, I believe that James O'Ray pulled the trigger. I think the evidence is abundant that James O'Ray pulled the trigger of the rifle to kill Martin Luther King Jr. 
But James Earl Ray did not wake up in the early morning of April 4th, 1968, all by himself, and say, today is the day I'm going to kill that king nigger. No, 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 no. Martin Luther King Jr.'s assassination was a result of a cold, calculated, premeditated conspiracy to kill him. And I believe that conspiracy goes right to the feet of, of the Hunt brothers in Texas. That's what I believe. Okay? I can't prove it. But that's that's what I believe. But don't don't insult my intelligence to think that some highly limited educated James O. Ray, he had a map of Canada, so he didn't have any education, he didn't have any geography. Where did he get he didn't know that? It was clearly it was so forth, you know? And he's and I and so he leaned over to me and he says, "You have some very strong opinions." I said, "Yes, I do." So I said, "You and the government may think that the case is closed, but I don't think so." And he said to me, "You didn't hear me say the case was closed, did you?" I said, "No." You didn't hear me say the case was closed, did you? I said, no, sir. Deep, right? And you know, by the way, I mean, you don't know, I'm going to tell you. Um, uh, he has a huge, uh, Comey had a huge desk in his office. Mm -hmm. It had a glass top on it. Under the corner of the glass top is a photostatic copy of the memo, of the memo, from Robert F. Kennedy, um, from J. Edgar Hoover, mm -hmm. to Robert F. Kennedy, asking the authority to wire to Martin Luther King Jr., in which the Attorney General had to countersign it, and it shows, okay, do it, okay, do it. He says the reason I'm showing you, Mr. Jones, is every time there's a meeting of agents in my office, particularly a new agent, before they leave, I make them look at this and I says, the FBI can never become that agency again. Describe April 4th, 1968. What were you doing? Where were you? Well, you know, I, I had left the country. Um, I, I left in 67, um, like a lot of people. Um, I was not going to be drafted. I had re sent my draft card in and, and uh, just uh, said I wasn't going to go. Um, and decided that, uh, you know, the other choices were five years in jail or leave. And I thought, well, I'd always wanted to see the world and saved up, my wife and I saved up whatever money we had. And uh, we, um, we left and in the early fall of 67 and came back. Where'd you go? I just ran around Europe, went to North Africa for a little bit and uh, just any place that, actually we started in Northern Europe, got cold, started moving toward the <laughs> southern part. Uh, Spain was kind of like California so we spent a lot of time, we were thinking about staying there for a while. But she got sick mm -hmm. and we had to come back and uh, that was in late March of 1968. And got to my parents' house, and uh, turned out that she was diabetic, didn't know it, and you know was just losing lots of weight, I think she's under 100 pounds, and mm. put her in the hospital. And Your parents' house where? In Los Alamos, New Mexico. Okay. And uh, so while she's in the hospital, turn on the TV, learn about Martin Luther King being assassinated. Mm -hmm is assassinated right there in Los Angeles. So it, for me, it was just a way of saying, look, this country is in real trouble. I mean, I, I, I recognized at that point, I gotta, I gotta live, live here, deal with the draft issue, get a draft lawyer and all that sort of stuff. But I knew, I didn't have to read Martin Luther King's Chaos or Community because what I came back to was chaos. And, and I think that the 50 years since then have been kind of putting a lid on it. 
and assuming that the problem's going to go away if we just don't look at it. And I think that his book is that, that reminder that, you know, look around the world right now. Democracy and diversity is a difficult, um, Vincent Harding, you know, who I admire a great deal, and you, you know obviously, um, he said we should, we should have advanced courses for everybody in democracy and diversity. Because if you are investing your destiny to a group of people, and they're not like you, you know, different religion, different, you know, other things, you're going to have to learn how, how to work with that group of mm -hmm. people. And I, I don't think we as Americans understand that that takes work. And if it doesn't, you're going to have Syria, you're going to have, you know, the kind of country that just comes completely unglued. Be sure to join our Bring the Funk fan club. Every dollar that you give to us supports our daily digital show. There's only one daily digital show out here that keeps it black and keep it real. as Roland Martin Unfiltered. Support the Roland Martin Unfiltered daily digital show by going to RolandMartinUnfiltered.com. Our goal is to get 20,000 of our fans contributing 50 bucks each for the whole year. You can make this possible. RolandMartinUnfiltered.com. You want to check out Roland Martin Unfiltered? youtube.com forward slash Roland S. Martin. And subscribe to our YouTube channel. There's only one daily digital show out here that keeps it black and keep it real. It's Roland Martin Unfiltered. See that name right there? Roland Martin Unfiltered. Like, share, and subscribe to our YouTube channel. That's youtube.com forward slash Roland S. Martin. And don't forget to turn on your notifications so when we go live, you'll know it.